Worship is what we are created for, but the worship of God is something that the Spirit of God needs to work in our hearts. So we pray particularly for you who are seeking that there might be answers, that those who are believers would find strength and refreshment as we worship God together. Let us begin with our meditation. beautiful day we did want to tell you again that it seems like the YouTube feed is not working currently we will record this service and you'll be able to see it in its entirety on YouTube later but for those of you who have found us on Facebook welcome maybe you could send a text and let everyone else know to join us now as we continue our worship with this call to worship from Psalm 16 I want you to know that this service today is filled with the good news that we have eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We will never die if Christ is our Savior. We live forever. That's the reality of the resurrection as we will explore it in this service today. So I invite you to stand where you are and let's begin with this call to worship. You are our Lord. Apart from you, we have no good thing. 
You alone are our portion and our cup. You make our lot secure. We keep our eyes always on the Lord. With Him on our side, we will not be shaken. You make known to us the path of life. You fill us with joy in Your presence, with eternal pleasures at Your right hand. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. Father, we boldly approach your throne because of what Jesus Christ has done. And as we have sung, he humbled himself, bled, and died so that we might experience this amazing love. Spirit, take your 
words, take the words of your, the God's word and apply it to our hearts that we may know that love once again. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you turn in your bulletin, we'll confess together what Christians throughout the centuries have believed in this statement called the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And if you're able to kneel, we'll take a few moments to personally confess our sins before this holy God. And let us confess our sins together as we use the words printed in the bulletin. I, a poor sinner, acknowledge before you, my God and Creator, that I have terribly and in many ways sinned against you, not only outwardly, but much more with inward blindness, unbelief, doubts, despondency, impatience, pride, covetousness, envy, hatred, malice, and all other sinful affections, as you, my Lord and God, know well, and I cannot deeply enough deplore. But I repent of these things, and am sorry for them, and heartily ask you for mercy, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now the words of the assurance of pardoning grace. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And let us respond to that assurance by singing the words printed in your bulletin from In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, Scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live.
Why don't you return to your seats and let's go before the Lord as we pray together. Our gracious God, we do believe and know that you are the sovereign King of kings and that because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for your sovereignty in our lives, even at this moment, that by your Holy Spirit, you are revealing to us the goodness and power and majesty of Jesus that reminds us that death does not have the last word, that Jesus has conquered death and the grave, and that for those who belong to Jesus, for his friends, we will be resurrected to new life at the end. That kind of love makes us come boldly to the throne of grace, knowing that our sins are forgiveness, that we've been washed in the blood of Christ. So, Father, we come to you with the needs of this body. We know we live in a fractured world of mistrust and hatred and prejudice, racism. We have little regard for life. Babies aborted, old life discarded not caring for brothers and sisters made in the image of God. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would send revival to our land, that this land would be one that overflows with righteousness and justice and love, that the Spirit of God would so invade the hearts of God's people that they would stand and be salt and light in this decaying age, that we would live with the hope of the resurrection we think of that hope of the resurrection and the goodness of your promises as we think about our church family and their needs here. We remember Kathy Jones today in the passing of her brother-in-law, David. We pray, Lord, for your encouragement and strength to that family and to our dear Kathy. Provide her with much needed comfort and all that she stands in need of today, we pray. We pray for Sharon Stork. And then we pray, Lord, that you would help with the uh, procedure that is on her heart, that you would be near to her and raise her up in strength and healing. We pray for Stanley Schrader, who had bicep surgery this week. Pray for him to recover and that you would bring him back to full strength as well. We continue to pour out our prayers to you on behalf of little Elliot Ann Vaughn, that micro preemie born to Rebecca Morris Vaughn and Philip Vaughn. Be with the Morris family and all those who are surrounding this family now. We ask for a miracle healing in the life of this little one. Comfort and strengthen them. Prove yourself mighty in their lives, we pray. We continue to remember all those who are suffering with ongoing sickness, fighting cancer and disease. We pray for Tracy Valerio this week, who is headed to receive surgery for cancer, and we ask for your healing upon her. We remember Carolyn Tremere and Renee Foss, Mildred Coleman, Patty Edenfield, Dakota Mack, Julie McDonald, Sharon Stork, Ronnie Barnes, Leslie Bogdanow, Eileen Brent, Lindsay Wright Edwards, Asher Allen, Alan Rogers, and Casey Larson. Father, it's a privilege to be able to name these by name because they are yours and we ask for your healing. Be the good shepherd and be very near to these. Lord, we pray for the ministries of this church, even as we're doing, continuing to do these services live on YouTube and Facebook, we understand that they are not without difficulty. We long to be back in this place. Please, O oh Lord, find a cure for this COVID-19 virus. We pray, O oh Father, to be near those who are suffering, that we could gather back in worship soon to proclaim the goodness of the Lord together, that the ministries of this church that are so highly relational and community-driven could continue with full strength. Please, O oh Lord, send your spirit. Do a mighty work in our hearts during this time. We pray for nothing less than revival. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much. In this time of the pandemic and social separation, many of us are tired and fatigued of uh, just missing our friends. And we want to be available to you as, and to give you some fixed points during the week uh, so that you can connect with the church and refresh yourselves in the middle of this fatigue. So this Wednesday, there is a live stream this week at First Pres. That's a weekly program now. And then similarly, on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, there's a prayer and pray service led by Kirk Sowers. We trust that both of those will refresh you and invigorate you in the middle of the week. Also on the website, there are other ways that you can be informed and connected and help others. There's a form there if you have a need or would like to help uh, serve somebody who might have a need. Also, there is a way to give. You can give online or through a check. And so those opportunities are available to you as well. More information is there, and we want you to stay informed and connected, and we look forward again, as Pastor Frank said, to being together with you once again. Until that time, let's now pass the peace. I invite you to take out your device or phone and to call or email or text someone the peace of Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace, brother. Peace. Peace, See you.
y'all hurry up and get back down here. This is terribly lonely, and uh, we can't wait to be able to do this together. We want to see your faces. Would you turn in John chapter, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to be reading this long narrative. There's so much here. I wish I could preach on it for about two hours. It's amazing as you get into these texts how rich they are, but don't worry. I'm only going to go an hour today, so thank you for tuning in and watching with us. John chapter 11, it's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And before we get into it, can, can we just pause a minute and think about the reality that Jesus did raise a few people from the dead, Lazarus being the most dramatic Jesus literally did raise somebody from the dead. We're so familiar with these texts, aren't we? That sometimes they just, we grow numb to them. But let me set up our text in this way. Probably many of you have seen online, on Facebook or YouTube, John Krasinski. He played Jim in The Office. That's the most well-known role he's had, but he does this series. I don't know if he's done five or six or eight of them now called Some Good News. And I can't watch through one of those. Sometimes they're 20 minutes or more long. I can't watch, get through any of them without crying. They're good tears, though. They're beautiful stories in this time of this pandemic where The stories are so grave, and the news is often so bad, and what we see through the media is so polarizing and even toxic and uh, even agenda-driven, no matter which persuasion you come from. So John Krasinski came up with this idea of some good news, and it's just stories, videos of incredible things that are happening because of God's common grace, really, in the lives of believers and unbelievers alike. But it made me think as I was looking at this passage today, because this passage is good news. In fact, if I were to ask you the question, what is the ultimate good news? I mean, the stories that we're seeing through John Krasinski's Some Good News are really inspiring and beautiful, but they're not the ultimate news. What is the ultimate good news? What is the greatest news? Certainly for it to be the greatest news, the, it would have to deal with ultimate issues, right? For something to be the greatest news, it would have to meet us at our deepest need. It would have to deal with ultimate things. The, the best news would have to be news that deals with the problem of death and suffering. It could not be the best news if it not, did not deal with our greatest problem. What is the, the best news? Wouldn't the best news be that you're not going to die, but you could live forever? Wouldn't the best news be that your loved ones will live forever if they belong to Jesus Christ with him in the new heavens and the new earth? What if you had the promise of eternal love an eternal bliss, an eternal life, and no fear of death. Wouldn't that be the ultimate good news? Wouldn't that be the best news? And the answer is emphatically yes. What we're going to read today is the best news because it deals with our greatest need. It deals with ultimate issues. It promises us how 
we can have eternal life and no fear in death and resurrected bodies that will live forever with the Lord. That's the message that John wants us to get through what Jesus does here in our text. It's this phrase, John 11, 27, John, John 11, 25, Jesus said to her, to Mary, I, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And he, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We started this new series called The Resurrection Changes Everything. And today's message from John 11 is foundational to see how the resurrection changes everything. Because we learn here today that Jesus, Jesus doesn't just offer resurrection and eternal life. He actually is the resurrection and the life. Now that was a long introduction to this text, but I think it's worth it because I want you to see how powerful this is in the hearts of believers. John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. 11, uh, verse one. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. After Jesus had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend, that's his disciples he's talking to, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. They did not understand, you see. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, he, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. 
But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. O Holy Spirit, would you open our hearts and our minds to understand and believe the truth and be transformed by it. Help us to leave this place, to leave this day of worship, glorying in the reality that you are the resurrection and eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This text is clearly an object lesson. Jesus is purposefully acting in such a way and doing something here that he wants to teach a lesson that no one can miss. Look with this with me at verse 4 so you can see the fact that Jesus really is trying to make a point here in what he's doing. Verse 4, it says this, When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be revealed through it. Then skip down to verses 40 through 42. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, this is the point, you see, if, if you believed, you would, not, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Do you see it? The text begins and ends with the fact that Jesus is making a point that he does not want them to miss, and that is that he is the one who has the power over life and death itself, that he is the resurrection and he is life. That's the object lesson in our text that Jesus wants them to see and believe with all their hearts. And what I want to do in our time we have this morning is to ask three questions of this text. And the good news, the best news that I've described to you builds as we move along. It gets greater and greater as, as the text moves through this narrative. But the first thing I want you to see is this question, what can we learn about Jesus, especially as we anticipate death and the issues of life and death, eternal life? What do we learn about Jesus? And the first thing I want you to see here from our text is God's sovereign purposes. You notice here the text is very clear that when Jesus heard about his friend's illness, he stayed two more days. It, it's it's countercultural, right? It, it's contrary to what we would think we would do. If any of us heard that someone we loved dearly was very ill, gravely ill, if we were able, wouldn't we stop everything we're doing and rush to the bedside or to see the family of this one that we love? But what we see with Jesus is he purposely waits two more days. We see Jesus here operating according to a sovereign timeline. He's operating on a different plane than we operate on because his purposes are different and greater and right. Jesus here is doing this on purpose because he wants to make sure that people understand that he really did raise Lazarus from the dead, that Lazarus really is dead. And so when they come to him and say, Jesus, the one that you love is ill, he doesn't rush there because in his sovereign plan, he wants to make this point. I think it's very important for us just to apply this here in this way. Jesus' 
operating according to different priorities and a different plan than we operate according to. Both Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary, come to Jesus and they ask him the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, meaning you didn't come according to our timetable, you didn't fulfill our expectations, you didn't do the things that we wanted you to do here, and Jesus would say to them, you're exactly right. I'm doing what I'm doing for two reasons. Here's the priority that motivates Jesus. The glory of God, his own glory, as the text tells us here at the beginning. I want you to see the glory of God. He says it in verse 4, and then he says it in verses 40 through 42 again. This is happening. What I'm doing, what motivates me is the glory of God and your belief. So Jesus is motivated he prioritizes above all things the glory of God and the belief and spiritual well-being of his friends, his followers. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, they're his dear friends. He doesn't come according to their timetable because on his mind is the glory of God and their benefit. He's working and doing things according to his timetable and his purposes. It's helpful for us, isn't it? Because Jesus often doesn't meet our expectations either. And he's interested in ultimate things. Things that are going to be for our best, for our eternal benefit. He's dealing with eternal life here. He's dealing with ultimate things, life and death and belief. He's sovereign in his purposes. He's sovereign in his timing. He is sovereign and his priorities. And so we see here that Jesus is interested in the triune glory of God and the sake of his followers. And so he doesn't act according to their timetable or their specific desires. Jesus won't always act according to what we want, and often he won't do so, even in sickness and death. He may not do what we want, but it's always for his glory and our good. It's not that Jesus is an egomaniac. It's just that Jesus knows that if we see him for who he truly is, we experience his glory and wisdom and power and majesty, then we're going to be all the better for it. And he's operating on a whole different plane than we are. We also see not just here his sovereignty at work, but we see his shepherd's heart. Because even as Jesus is doing this object lesson for God's glory and for their good, for their belief and trust in him, we also see Jesus who is deeply emotional in this text. It comes out in many different places, but we see his love and his compassion. We even see his anger. Lazarus was the one that Jesus deeply loved, the text tells us. And the text tells us that he deeply loved Martha and Mary. So we have not just a sovereign Savior here, we have a shepherding heart here of tender love and compassion for those he loves. He cares deeply. You know, the Greek gods were known for being apathetic, for being uh, without pathos, without emotion. They were known for just being deities, quote unquote, in the sky, but they did not feel emotion. But Jesus shows deep emotion including what's incredible in this story is that Jesus understands how Mary and Martha feel when they come to him and say, Jesus, the one we love and the one you love is sick. He understands that need of their hearts. He understands the pain that they feel. He understands it for you too in your sickness and in impending death for those that we love. Jesus knows that feeling, and he deeply feels it with you. And even though he has sovereign purposes, it doesn't mean he's indifferent to our pain. He loves deeply. And he shows it, doesn't he? He shows that love for his friends and for Lazarus when he goes to the grave. And those two words, Jesus wept. So powerful, so sweet goes and he sees them in their pain, he sees them in their suffering, he sees them in their misery, and he says, the text says that Jesus wept. How beautiful is it to know that even a sovereign Savior has a shepherd's heart 
and he hurts with those who hurt. He is not indifferent to our suffering. You see the way he tenderly deals with Martha and Mary. He accepts them in their weakness and their complaint. Lord, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Where were you? He, he feels their lament. He hears their lament. He takes it to heart. He doesn't rebuke them. A bruised reed he will not break. And he comes to them in their pain and suffering, and he's tender and he's compassionate, and he's that way with you too. We also see the shepherd's heart in the anger here. The text says two times, verse 33 and 38, that Jesus was deeply moved. We have trouble in all of our translations really finding the, the, the nuance of what this really means, but inside the heart of Jesus in this moment, there is an indignant rage. There is a, an anger, a holy righteous anger, there's a frustration, there is a, a mourning and deep wailing in his heart in this moment because he comes and he sees death at work. He sees the results of sin and he sees suffering and he sees the unbelief of these Jewish people, those for whom he came to live and die. And it's that scene there in the darkness of their unbelief and the pain of death and suffering that Jesus groans in his heart. He shows that anger. He shows that, pat, that pathos, that emotion, that love and compassion because he is a shepherd who cares. And then we also see, we learn this about Jesus, the point of this text. It's all building to this, but we see his supernatural power and authority over death. We see a sovereign Savior who is supernatural in that he is Lord over death itself. Now, we've seen, if you've studied the book of John at all, several of these I am statements. I am. It's a claim to deity. I am the bread of life. John wants us to see these in the way he unfolds the life of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am uh, the source of living waters. But it all culminates in this I am here where Jesus says to Martha, I am God, and my deity is seen in that I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Like I said at the beginning, it doesn't mean that he just gives resurrection. It doesn't mean that he just gives eternal life. It means that he is himself the source of life. Spiritual and physical life is only found in Jesus. There's a whole lot of dead men and women walking who are spiritually dead because we're connected to our first uh, federal head, Adam. And when God promised, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And the moment that Adam and Eve, as our representatives, ate of that fruit, death came, spiritual death. And as Ephesians 2 and Colossians 3 remind us, we are dead in our trespasses and sins until Jesus makes us alive again. So when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, all who followed in their train were immediately spiritually dead. Slaves to Satan, no hope of eternal life. Spiritual death and physical death came as a result of the fall. We were not meant to die. But raised to life in Jesus, we can have eternal life, we understand, from what Jesus does in this miracle with Lazarus. Because as we're united to Jesus, we are made alive. Jesus is the life. And Jesus is also the resurrection. Jesus is saying here in our text that statistically speaking, 100% of people are going to die. If it's not COVID-19, it might just be old age, but every single person is going to die. And so we need to know what happens beyond the grave. What happens the moment we die? 
So Jesus, in this miracle of Lazarus, raising him from the dead, is pointing to this reality, that those who die in the Lord never die. They live forever because Jesus is the resurrection. And we understand from 1 Corinthians 15 and other places that Jesus is the first fruits of our own resurrection. That Jesus, because he died and was raised to life by the power of the Spirit under the ordination, foreordination of God, Jesus being raised to life is the first fruits of our own resurrection. So we know without a shadow of a doubt that we too will be raised to life because Jesus, the first fruits of our own resurrection, has been raised to life. And we are united to him, so we can't help be. When he came out of the grave, we came out of the grave too. Jesus is the resurrection, and Jesus is the life. And though we will die physically, we will go through the process of death. We will never really die. We will never face judgment. We will never suffer the pains of hell. We will never be alienated from God. For those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go through the process of death, but you will live forever. This is what he is saying here. I am the resurrection and the life. I offer eternal life now, not someday, but now. And I offer resurrection with glorified bodies, just as I'm pointing to in the resurrection of Lazarus himself. Death does not have the final word. Jesus has the final word. And Jesus shows up to that grave with Lazarus. And he sees the death and decay and suffering. And he sees and he feels the finality. And he sees the pain. And he feels the loss that everyone else is feeling right there. He, he smells the smell of death. And he walks right up to the grave. And he says to the grave, open up. Lazarus come out. You know, many have said before that if Jesus had not saved, he had such power over death, such power over the grave, that if he had not called Lazarus by name, that every dead person within the vicinity of his voice would have risen to life because he's that powerful over death. But Jesus walks right up to that grave and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out of that grave signifying Jesus' own resurrection and our own resurrection too. Do you know that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to show up at our graves one day? And he's going to call us by name. And he's going to say, John, come out of that grave. Receive your resurrected body and live forever. Think about the most recent deaths in our church. The names Jonathan Bice or Jacko Tyson or Sissy Morris uh, come to my mind as some of our most recent ones. Also, Julia Joyner. And God's going to show up one day at those who have died in the Lord. While their bodies are in the grave, their souls are immediately with Jesus right now. And they're waiting on the day when Jesus comes back to the grave and he says, Sissy, rise up. Jack, get out of the grave. Jonathan, come out of the tomb. He's going to say that to our loved ones. Julia, your time of rest is over. Come out of the grave. Receive your glorified body. This is what Jesus already said for John chapter 5. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all those who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. And that's what Jesus is signifying here. By the way, I have to say this, and I know that this may go a little long today, so if you want to just cut it and go to lunch, you can, or pause it, whatever you need to do, but I'm not going to stop. I want to finish. Jesus, or John tells us that Lazarus two times was in the grave for four days. Why does he emphasize that? Because the Jews had this sort of mystical thought that when a person died, their spirit or, or their soul sort of stayed around near their body for about three days. 
that maybe possibly they could come back to life. And you know, Jesus has already raised to life two other people, and they were raised instantly. So some could discount it. But Jesus is making it so clear here, crystal clear, that, that Lazarus has been there four days. That's why Mary says, uh, Mary or Martha, I can't remember at the, at the moment, one of them says, or oh, Martha, Lord, he's been in the, dead, the grave four days now. He's going to stink. The decay has already started to happen to his body. Or as the King James Version we grew up on said, Behold, he stinketh. Lazarus would, was dead dead. And Jesus is making it crystal clear that he has power over death and will raise us to life. Death does not control us. Jesus is the resurrection. He controls death. And death is simply his, at his disposal to bring us into the presence of God. What does this mean for us? Well, I've said so much of it already. I won't take too much time with this. But it means that we don't have, as we sang, no fear in life, or no guilt in life, no fear in death. That because we are united to Jesus, that there's no condemnation for us. We have eternal life. We have spiritual life in us by the power of the Spirit. And that when the hour of death comes, we're not going to be afraid anymore. This is what this text wants us to see about what this knowledge means for us. We have no fear in death. You know, Jesus said in verse 11, I'm going now to wake Lazarus. And that's the confidence the believers have, that when we die, it's, it's just as if we're sleeping. Jesus just has to come and, and wake us up. We are not afraid of death anymore, even though we go through the process of death, and we don't like it. And death is the last enemy to be defeated. And no one wants to go through the process of death. That terrifies us. We don't know what that looks like or how we're going to die, but we don't have to be afraid of death because Jesus has promised us resurrection in him. Death's really the, the parlor room, just holding people until they go into the eternal banquet of the Lord. The process of death is just a, like a chauffeur driver just driving you home. We're not afraid of death. We also can now grieve with hope. You see, we still grieve, don't we? We lose people that we love, but God doesn't lose them. They're raised to life in Jesus. And even now, people are awaiting their resurrection bodies. I won't read 1 Thessalonians 4 for the sake of our time. But Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who've fallen asleep. Jesus is going to come, and he's going to raise the dead to life first. And then those who are still alive will meet them in the air and will be forever with the Lord. So we grieve but we grieve with hope. And then we see, as Paul told us in Philippians chapter 1, that uh, dying is gain. We now have a whole new outlook on death. The fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life means that we look at death completely different from the world. We, we almost have, if we're thinking correctly, a, a giddy anticipation that one day I get to die and be with Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, or come quickly, death. It doesn't really matter to me because I want to go and be in the presence of God. Thomas Brooks said this, A Christian knows that death shall be the funeral of all his sins, his sorrows, his afflictions, his temptations, his vexations, his oppressions, his persecutions. He knows that death shall be the resurrection of all his hopes, his joys, his delights, his comforts, his contentments. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord face to face. Dying is gain. It is better by far. And so what we take away from Jesus being the resurrection and the life is this reality, that dying is gain. And we see death a whole different way. Jesus raises us to life in him. And so we can't wait for our death because we'll be with the Lord forever. Lastly, third question I ask of this text, what are we supposed to do with this knowledge? I asked you, what are we supposed to learn about Jesus? What do we learn here about ourselves in this? And then lastly, what do we do with this? In other words, how do we get in on this? This is the greatest news ever, that people who die in the Lord don't really die. They live forever. 
and they have resurrected bodies. How can I sign up for that deal? Well, it's clear, isn't it, from the text, over and over and over and over, it, become, it, it's, it becomes ours when we believe. When we believe. Over a hundred times in John's gospel, he calls people to believe something. That's the point of his book, the point of his uh, narrative, that those that we would believe who Jesus is and have eternal life. And the same's here in our text. How do we get in on this deal? We believe what Jesus says here. We believe the truth. And we see it, uh, Jesus said this in John 6, 47, Truly, I, truly, I tell you, he who believes in me has eternal life. In verse 25, he says it here, Whoever believes in me. And then he asks Martha this question, Do you believe this? Do you believe the truth that I am the resurrection and the life? I won't take the time to read these, but verse 15, verse 27, verse 26, verse 40, verse 41, 42, 45, 48, all in this text mention belief. Believing what Martha confessed herself, that you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God, you are the resurrection and the life. And Jesus says, if you believe that, if you believe that God, Jesus is God in the flesh who came and lived and died in your place, and you believe that he is the promised anointed one, the Messiah, the Lord in the flesh, then you in that moment will receive eternal life and you will live forever. And one day it will be you live forever with a glorified, resurrected body. That's what we're to do with this. If you want in on this deal, all you got to do is believe. Now I'll close in this way. On the Wednesday video that we did live at noon at First Pres, or this week at First Pres, Lucy Brantley read just a small clip, a portion of a response that right when I heard it, it gripped me to my heart and I knew this is exactly what we're talking about this morning in this sermon. Lucy tells, uh, told me the story after I called her about it, about Lucy, I mean, sorry, about Karen and Alan Goddard. Karen and Alan Goddard were missionaries in the Far East for many years, and then they came back to the University of Georgia, and they began working with CREW, formerly known as um, Campus Crusade for Christ. They were ministering to college students on the campus in the ministry crew. But then, just about a year ago, Karen came down with leukemia. And she fought valiantly. But in the end, they knew there was no treatment for her, her leukemia. This couple that people loved so much, so well. And as Karen started to see that the end was coming and she was back home on hospice care. Uh, her husband, Ken, he wrote this, uh, sorry, Alan wrote this in his, um, in some online journal for people to see. Here's what Alan wrote. In the early morning hours of today, May 11, Karen went home to be with the Lord and was presented in his presence. The end was something that Karen longed for, from the moment the doctors informed us it was near. She was eager to be rid of the broken body with which she had lived her whole life and longed to see Jesus face to face, talking of it often. We had several conversations which started with this question. This is what Karen would ask. Why has he not come to get me yet? Some were even humorous. He says that one morning Karen woke up and uh, she looked and she exclaimed, what are you doing here? She said to Alan, her husband, what are you doing here? It occurred to him a few minutes later that she was shocked at seeing him, wondered what he was doing there because she had hoped instead to wake up and see the face of Jesus. They laughed about that. Then later on, he writes this. 
To which I replied, yes, I was not, oh, no. The next morning when I said good morning to Karen, she looked at me and said, I'm still here, dang it. Well now, Karen, you're not still here, dang it. Then he says this, for those of you who are already starting to text and ask, how are you doing? The answer is that Lizzie, this is his daughter, and I feel pretty much like you would expect us to. And these are the words that Lucy Brantley shared with us on Wednesday. Personally, the Thessalonians passage above describes it well. A deep grief accompanied almost paradoxically by a soaring hope and confidence. We feel all that. Personally, I feel like a donut, like the best part of me is missing. I feel like I have a cannonball-sized hole in my chest, and I can't wriggle away from it no matter how I turn. I am grieving beyond words, but I feel an unshakable hope. I have soul-filling joy for Karen right now. I'm insanely jealous of her. She gets to see Jesus. There's this empty hole in me that I feel, but I feel all of this at once, and I guess that's just how it happens. I thought it was so important to end by reading all of that to you because I don't know Alan, and I did not know Karen, but Alan and Karen are exemplifying the faith, the belief that Martha is exemplified here, that Jesus calls all of us to believe. This is the greatest news because in Jesus Christ, we understand that he is the resurrection and the life and that we too get eternal life and resurrected bodies to live with him forever because of his own resurrection, which Lazarus' resurrection pointed to. Oh, brother and sister in Christ, be encouraged. Let's pray together. Father, this text is so rich. There's so much more we could talk about. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would take and apply what has been read and said here that it would inspire all of us to live with renewed hope in our own resurrection and praising Jesus that he is the source of eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.